Let us pray. Eternal God, in the reading of the scripture, may your word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. For the last uh, several days on my way to work, I noticed the, the sign on Rigor Road Baptist Church on Portland Street. And um, it says, God doesn't have favorites, but the sign guy does. Go Team Canada, go. <laughs> Love that sign. We, we talked about the Olympics and some of the memorable moments and favorite sports. And um, for me, I think that one of the memorable moments is just simply having the South and the North come in together and compete together, uh, the Koreas. What will come of that? It's hard to know. But that sense of the Olympic spirit, the Olympic model is faster, higher, stronger. But there's more than that. There's that, that spirit of to compete, the spirit to be ambassadors, the spirit of finding the best in the situation. And I just did some things and I was looking at symbols and other things. I wondered about the Olympic rings and uh, what they meant. Uh, the, one of the uh, co-founders of the modern Olympic Games, Baron Pierre de Gaubertin, in 1912 created the five interlocking rings. And they are various colors from blue, yellow, black, green, and red on a white field. And the interlocking rings uh, in 1912 were meant to uh, talk about the five continents and that have come to compete. And they say that the colors represent every flag. The colors of every flag is intertwined and interconnected in the rings. So those moments that we've had, those uh, times in which we have tried to figure out our place in, in creation, our place in the world. I've just finished reading my Christmas gift, uh, Dan Brown's Origins, and um, it's an interesting read. I found it a little bit predictable in the Dan Brown series, but it was talking about, you know, the origin of life where we come from and where we're going, and um, about uh, a particular person who has found the answer. And um, it's, it's a typical uh, Dan Brown suspense thriller and uh, with um, various symbology and other things wrapped in. But one of the things that they talk about is that uh, Religion sort of happens when science fails to explain something according to the book. And it's an interesting uh, argument and conversation. So how do we explain these events that have happened in our, in our memory, that have been a part of the, the memory of, of creation since the very beginning? And there are stories throughout all cultures about the flood. There was some particular event that made it necessary for all cultures to talk about and to share a story about what the flood means. And we are happening to hear one particular story out of all those ancient stories today. And then, as we think about this story, we're also, our attention is drawn sadly to the tragedy in the United States and to the tragedy of a culture of violence and guns that allows AR-15 assault weapons and other weapons to be purchased legally by 
an 18-year-old, and actually that's not the point, to be purchased by anyone. And then the political comments that happen, and uh, some of our John Adder, and uh, uh, some of the political cartoons around that. Um, and it's raw. It's, it's hard to comprehend what has happened and what continues to happen in that culture. And it's not just in the United States, but in the United States it seems to be a cultural piece that's so embedded in who they are and their identity that it is hard to move beyond that and to move beyond the influence of the National Rifle Association, for instance. But I've been interested in some of the vigils and the rallies that have taken place over the last little while, and maybe something might happen because this has been a catalyst to engage that generation in the political and social and moral and spiritual fight. We'll have to see, hopefully. There will not have to be more deaths in order for something to happen. So does our story today help us figure this out? The rainbow. Let's just move the one slide forward. This slide, this photo was taken um, just the week before we became an affirming ministry. And uh, somebody, and you can, you can see where it is, they were up on, I don't know which floor, but they were up on one of the floor over at Nantucket Center in their apartment, and they saw these double rainbows. And it was so uh, fitting that we were becoming an affirming ministry in the same week. And the, f the rainbow. Move to the next slide just to give you a fence a fuller sense of what a rainbow is like. What does that remind you of? What symbol does that remind you of? Alex, anything? Does that symbol remind you of anything? Does it look like anything? Okay. Yeah, guys, anything else? Do any of you do archery? You tried archery? Uh, long, bows long bows with your uncle, okay. Yeah, and a bow at a camp, okay. Archery's fun when you do it with, the, with targets and stuff. And that is, in terms of the ancient, ancient cosmology, there was sort of a sense that God, um, God or gods, um, when they became angry or didn't like what was happening. And in the Genesis story, we hear about how creation is corrupted and evil and God is saddened by that, and the flood happens. And in ancient cosmology, it was God taking control, God using might, God using a weapon to destroy. But in this symbol, what's God doing with the weapon? Making it into something peaceful. He's hanging it up. Long before Isaiah talked about uh, turning swords into plowshares, changing weapons of war into weapons of life, this covenant happens. The rainbow in the sky is a reminder primarily for God. And it says right there, primarily for God, that when I see this, I will remember. And I'll remember my promise. There has to be a different way of living. There has to be a different way of interacting with creation. There's a poem that caught my attention, especially in light of the events of this week. And I cannot find the, the author's name anywhere for the poem. But 
Listen to its words. A rainbow reminds us of God's promise. A blessing poured down through rain and tears. A blessing in mixed in rays on drops of joy and sadness. A rainbow reminds us of God's sadness. Disappointment in creation, humanity turning away, caring more for self than God and others. A rainbow reminds us of storms past, weathering cloudy darkness, life's hardships and trials, feet shuffling forward, love a weight and relief. A rainbow reminds us of future blessings, promises carved of sky, visible but not always realized, grace given to all, blessing us in its abundance. Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, a rainbow is a rainbow only and precisely because it is made up of different colors. We are placed on earth to discover that we are made for togetherness, for interdependence, and complementarity. Complementary territory, territory, caught my attention. I wonder, is that actually a word? It is. A relationship or situation in which two or more different things improve or emphasize each other's qualities. So a culture based on the complementarity of men and women. How those two groups, separate, do are present a certain picture, but together there's a complementarity relationship that really defines and creates a whole new meaning that couldn't happen separately. It's known mostly in physics. The concept of two contrasted theories, such as wave and particle theories of light, may be able to explain a set of phenomena, although each separately only accounts for some aspects. Donald Smith, a commentator, writes, the rainbow with all its vibrant colors coming after a light drizzle or a torrential downpour can remind us of the unity and diversity, the complementarity of God's creation. And as I said before, it's that symbol that reminds God, whenever I see the rainbow, I will remember the covenant that I've made with you and with all of creation. And the reasons behind the flood at this point are not important. They are a story, an origin story. The issue is the promise. The promise, the covenant, and all that it entails, and it gets summed up neatly in this sign that we see occasionally after a rain. This bow that has been placed on the shelf has been placed down. No longer will weapons of war, no longer will weapons of violence be the way that creation is responded to and creation is lived in. God has hung up this weapon in the sky, God is the first to turn a sword into a plowshare. This happens long before Isaiah because God, in God's essence, knows that power and might never work. It is self-sacrifice. It is love. It is mercy. Yet here, almost at the very beginning of Genesis, God, after experimenting with expelling us from the garden for being a bit overreaching and destroying the earth with the flood, hangs up the divine weaponry in the sky and says, I'm putting it away. I'm converting it to a technicolor thing of purest beauty. As if God is saying, when we, you and I, see the rainbow, we'll stop. 
together and will remember that our God promised, promised to be with us always. What remains to be seen is what we do with our side of the rainbow. I mean, on the other side, regardless of what God does, God will remember God's promises. But on our side, what do we do with the rainbow? Do we see God? Do we live in God's shadow? Do we follow God's example? And can we take our bows, with which we were perhaps going to fire a shot in anger or revenge, and turn it instead into a means for making someone's day a little brighter, a little more joyous, and in doing so, color the world a little bit. In this amazing cosmic moment, wherein sunlight and raindrops interact in just the right balance, like a prism, to create this thing of beauty, God says, remember, remember. I think this week we need to remember. Amen.